my name is Keenan Russell. My pronouns are they, them. Uh, and this video is for La Catedra Libre de Estudios Trans de la Universidad de Buenos Aires. Um, I am a senior policy officer at ILGA Europe, the European region of the International Lesbian, Gay, Bisexual, Trans, and Intersex Association. Uh, and I'm also the director of a small NGO called the Trans Survivors Network that works on uh, issues related to trans people who've been exposed to sexual violence. Um, today I'm going to talk about uh, single-sex detention and the consequences that it has for trans people and the legal framework uh, around that detention. Um, I got interested in this topic uh, when I started working in the international human rights space a few years ago. Um, one of the conversations that I was seeing happen was about the very pressing need to ban conversion therapy, right? so-called conversion therapy, so practices that attempt to change someone's sexual orientation or gender identity. Um, and the conversations that were happening there to, fee to me felt quite narrow, unfortunately. It was largely focused on religious institutions uh, and medical practitioners uh, who were engaging in uh, electroshock therapy, uh, giving medication, uh, aversion therapies, uh, behavioral modification therapies, um, be that under a license or not. But from my frame of reference, those specific practices aren't the entirety of what fits the definition of practices designed or having the impact of changing an individual's sexual orientation or gender identity. Um, so the assertion that, I, that I'm making is that holding trans people in single-sex detention facilities, so prisons, immigration detention, uh, psychiatric hospitals where, where an individual is, is interred, uh, for a period of time, all of those have the same structural impact as these other types of conversion practices. We need to step back a bit and look at the legal situation that trans people are in generally uh, to understand this argument. The first piece of it is legal gender recognition based on human rights principles, so the ability to change one's name and uh, gender marker in their legal documents, uh, is only available in like 2% of the population in the world. Really, really small percent of the world population has access to legal gender recognition that is quick, accessible, transparent, uh, and based on self-determination, right? There are eight countries. Uh, the rest of the planet has some kind of barrier to legal gender recognition or no access whatsoever. Uh, so when you look at that, what that means then is that the vast majority of trans detainees around the planet are being detained on the basis of their sex assigned at birth. When they get to the detention facility, uh, they are placed in a single sex space, generally based on their sex assigned at birth. Uh, they may be given an option to self-identify, but that's actually really quite rare uh, that a trans person is able to say, I want to be in this facility and have that request be accepted or respected. So they get put into a single sex detention facility based on their sex assigned at birth. Uh, when you get there, there are a limited number of clothing options available. Um, generally, those are very sex specific uh, and it's not very possible to gain access to gender affirming clothing. Um, unless a person has already legally started transition, it's often very difficult to start transition in the detention facility. Uh, and again, sort of looking at the global legal framework around legal gender recognition, access to transition-related health care that's not on the black market is also very, very limited. So having a track record of this being a medication that you're taking under medical supervision and that it should be continued uh, is, is rare. Uh, and so people get to the facility and no longer have access to that tra transition-related care. And they're housed with all people 
that are their sex assigned at birth or the vast majority, right? So you're in a circumstance where sex assignment uh, is the entirety of the world. It's people that are around you, it's what you're allowed to wear, it's how you're allowed to act, it's your access to medical care. Uh, the consequence of that is one of two things, right? Either the individual persists in their gender identity and expressing their gender identity and ends up at risk of physical, psychological, or sexual violence, or the person changes their gender expression to fit the system. That forced choice isn't a choice in a legal sense, right? Because when a person has to choose between two human rights, things that are uh, guaranteed as part of their fundamental human rights, so the right to a freedom of expression on one hand, uh, or to self-determination, and the right to safety on the other hand, the right to be free from violence, uh, that's not actually a choice. Individuals can't be put in a position of making that choice. Uh, and the force that's involved then on making that choice is in itself a practice that impacts a person's sexual orientation or gender identity, and thus is conversion therapy. Uh, so the assertion then has to be that there is no way to hold trans people in single-sex detention facilities that is not tantamount to torture or cruel and cruel or inhumane treatment, which conversion therapy is. Uh, the only potential option, right, would be to hold trans people only with other trans people. But what that would do is increase the criminalization and the institutionalization of trans people, which is in itself also uh, a structural human rights violation. Uh, so if we take this argument all the way to the end, the place that it goes is that there's no way to hold trans people in single-sex detention with anybody that doesn't violate their fundamental human rights. Thanks a lot. Como vuelve en el día la flor